Good afternoon, all you brave souls. Does everybody have a handout? I just want to do a little housekeeping first. There should be some in the middle of the tables there. Just a one pager. I try to keep life simple. Everybody got one? Yes. Okay. Anybody else need one? We're good, we're good, we're good. Okay. In case somebody comes to join you at your table, I'll leave a couple of extras there. Give me a shout. Actually, I'll, give, I'll turn the rest of them over to you so that um, if you need to hand them out, you can. Okay. I'm taking your room monitor. You've already heard all the spiels, I am sure, about everything. So I'm not going to repeat it again. Um, all I need to know is who needs, yeah, just raise your hands and I'll walk around. And turn it I, figured, I, figured in the, I figured in this session everybody's going to need them. I should have just put them on the table. And I'll turn it over to Joyce. You want to introduce yourself? I would be happy to do that. My name is Joyce Eisenbrown, and I am here from the lovely community of Fargo, North Dakota. I'm delighted to come down. And you have flowers already here. We're just, we've gone from winter, truly over Easter, I still had two feet of snow in my front yard. I wasn't any happier about that than you sounded just now. However, it has suddenly leaped from winter and we are in full summer mode. It was 70 degrees when I left home and I went, Oh, I hope it's nice when I go to Atlanta because I'm going to be just crushed if I'm giving up 70 degrees to come to anything less. So I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you for the opportunity to present some information that I started looking at a few years ago. In the interest of full disclosure, I'm not a nurse. And you're going, but you're talking about nursing. Yeah because I have had the privilege of watching them in action for a number of years, admiring, being astonished, being amazed at the compassion, the care, the professional calm that you operate with on a regular basis in the midst of what looks like absolute and total chaos on occasion. <laughs> and I'm kind of going, how do you do that? So let me give you a quick understanding of who I am here to, to begin with, and that is that you, you can give credit for a lot of things to your moms, right? Well, I'm giving credit to some things to my mom as well. In her later years, she started having some cognitive issues, and we needed to get her off of the farm because where I lived was 350 miles away from the farm and I was the closest of the five siblings. So there needed to be some things and guess what? She came to live with us and if you want to go to my wonderful hubby over here and go, wow, later, you can do that. He gets the extra star in the crown because for three years my mom lived with us so I got a chance before I knew anything about Eden and culture change, I got a chance to see what that home environment was all about. As she needed more care, we needed to find some other option for her and were, I think, divinely guided to pick a facility in town that had already adopted the Eden Alternative philosophy of care. And we were tickled to find a group of people who cared deeply, were wonderful folks, about providing her care, and that's when I got introduced to Eden, and I went, huh, well this makes perfectly good sense, why doesn't everybody do this? This just, of course this is a logical way to, to do things. I volunteered there, was on the organization's board for a time, and then when my term ended for the board, I wound up trying to figure out how to get back in this wonderful organization again. So I started working there as their marketing and development director and spent the next 10 years working in that organization. Wound up getting certified as an Eden associate and then went, I want to do a little more, became an Eden educator, had the opportunity to do some training and teaching with that 
love the concept, love the philosophy. And when I had the chance to go back and work on a master's, it seemed logical to take a look at this whole culture change piece. Now, obviously, I couldn't do the broad total picture. But because I had such an admiration for so many of the nurses that I saw in action, and there was some literature already on the frontline staff, I thought, you know what, I'm going to take it up and take a look at the nurses. Figure out what in the world makes them tick the way that they do. Because they are amazing people and do amazing things. So the whole perception of geriatric nurses about culture change became part of my master's thesis. So you're getting some of that piece today as we go along. We're going to be talking about what is your story and the perceptions of geriatric nurses, but looking at culture change from that perspective, looking at and seeing what they had to offer. And I will tell you that it really comes down, as so much of Eden is, it comes down to what's your story and how are you using the words to make a difference. So we'll take a look at that. How many of you in your organizations right now have openings for nurses? Almost all of you. I was astonished when I heard Sherbrooke the other day talk about that they have a 93% retention rate. And I went, Whoo, wow. I will tell you that in, in terms of long-term care, if you're curious about what's going on across the country, that is not typical for retention it just doesn't happen. So often we have needs, we have spaces open in our organizations for those wonderful nurses. Research would indicate that, that nurses want go into the field because they have a desire, a need to nurture, to care, that they want to make a difference. Very often their life experiences have led them in a path where they really resonate with those older adults. That's how they got there. That's why they want to be there. And they really want to make that difference. It comes down to they choose this career because it satisfies something really essential in their spirits and heart. They really, it connects all the way. It's something inside that goes, yeah. I'm in the right place doing the right thing. And I wanted to find out why. What is it that does that resonating? So when, when I started talking to some of the nurses and found out that there's some really um, interesting things, you get different answers, but there's some very strong connections when you talk about what appeals to nurses. If they're coming, and the nurses that I interviewed, most of them had some kind of a traditional nursing home background, if you will. And what they talked about, about that experience, was that there was a lot of routine. There was sometimes more of an emphasis on task, perhaps. But they really felt they provided good care. Within that framework, within that structure, they still provided the very best care they knew how to give. They were proud of the care that they gave then, and they were very proud of the care that they gave in the Eden Alternative environment in which they were working now. Again, the Eden Alternative offered, they thought, more opportunity for innovation, and we'll talk about that in a minute. They loved the whole perspective of the resident first piece. And again, they were providing the very best care that they knew how to give. That was still resonating with them all the way. They really wanted that care piece all the way through. What was interesting sometimes, I thought, was that the relationship that they had, that they found so fascinating in the Eden Alternative, those resident first relationships became very important. 
and changed how they were providing care. The trick was, how do you have nurses that are in traditional facilities or in traditional roles hear about what culture change or the Eden alternative has to offer? We'll talk a little bit about that as we go ahead. Whoops, sorry. <laughs> Blew it. But as I said, this is part of my master's thesis. It's a, it was a qualitative study. So are you going to take every word and, and say, oh yeah, it, it fits exactly? It's not quantitative, it is qualitative. In other words, it may not be universally generalizable, but it may give you some clues what you can take home to your own facility. And that's where we're going. I did the interviews in two facilities, both of which had adopted the Eden Alternative facility. One about 16 years prior to the study, one about two years prior to the study. I wanted the change in perspectives. People who had fought the good fight for over a decade and people who were just nicely new on the journey, getting their pers perspectives. I asked them about some of the perceptions that they had, about the needs that they had. What were their thoughts about their current role? And I also asked, if everything being equal, if you had to choose, let's say you moved into a brand new community and you had one nursing home that was offering you a position and it was fairly traditional, had five stars from CMS, so it was quality care, and you had a second option and it had culture change, in this case the Eden Alternative, they were certified with that, same kind of position, same kind of salary, same kind of benefits, five-star rating over here as well. Which one would you pick? What do you think the answer was? Would they pick traditional or would they pick the, the culture change organization? They picked culture change. <laughs> they picked because their experience in a culture change organization had made such an impact on them. Even though many of them had come out of a traditional facility, they had worked now for a period of time in a culture change organization and went, we'd go there. We would go there. So let's take a look at why. Do you ever wake up in the morning and feel something like this? This to me sort of embodied what happens sometimes with, with the nursing folk. There's both a national and, could I say, international nursing shortage. You have people across the world. In Japan, there's all kinds of alternatives that they're looking at from a technology standpoint because they don't have nurses to come and check on people. They're, they're trying to do it technologically because they don't have the individuals. China is facing some of the same things. Other parts of the world have similar issues. There's a nursing shortage all the way across. So you have, given that, you have elders who are looking for what? All of the domains of well-being. They want the autonomy, the identity, the respect, the safety, the security, all of the issues that go into well-being, they want all of that. Well, what's on the other side? You have all the societal rules. You have all the rules and regulations. I have watched, okay, any state surveyors in here? Okay, this is true confession. You're, you're far enough away from home, hopefully. I have practically hidden in my office on occasion for fear that I would do something that would trigger a deficiency in my facility. It's like they're in the building, I am being very careful what I do because I don't want to inadvertently overstep something and, and get things happening in my facility that normally wouldn't. So I'm very careful when survey happened. I said on occasion, I told our director of nursing that the best thing I could do for them during survey was simply hide in my office and she laughed and then she agreed and <laughs> we went on from there. Not that I called the elders deary and sweetie as I went by them, but it is the inadvertent things that I didn't want to have happen. 
So you have, on the one side, you have the elders. On the other side, you have all the rules, regulations, quality assurance, safety, all the stringent things that need to happen to, keep, to make life safe in many respects. Added to that, you have family members that make life interesting for everybody, right? Please tell me that some of you have interesting family members for your adults. Yeah, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. I pointed <laughs> <at> you. <laughs> when we go and visit family member, or families, we, we inevitably get in the car when we go back and go, you do know that that particular individual in your family is just weird. Yes. And then the next time we go visit the other side of the family and the, the conversation repeats, you do know that that family member that you have is weird. Yes. So we have equal shares in that. It does work. Sorry, I've got a tickle in the throat. So it is one of those issues where there's a lot of pressure on the nurses from all sides to maintain, to do good things. And yeah, there have to be days when you just want to pull your hair out. By the same token, you're the face of the organization. So you get to put on your game face and handle it with that professional demeanor and compassion all the way through. Because that's what, it, what is expected of you in the process. So what's, what's going on? In terms of overall global view in, in the US, only about one third of the nursing homes in the country have acknowledged that they have adopted some kind of culture change. Not only Eden Alternative, but any kind of culture change. Only about a third say that they are affiliated with a formal culture change effort. That's not a big emphasis yet in the country. CMS has added a more resonant focus on a number of the rules and regs that they uh, talk about, but by the same token, it still is sort of secondary to please chart this now kind of emphasis that they still do. Culture change isn't part of very many nursing programs. Geriatrics tends to be a very small piece of most nursing training. How many of you had more than one unit of geriatric training in your nurses' training, for those of you that are nurses. I heard none, a little bit more. But unless you are a specialist or have gone on for additional training, usually geriatrics is like a little bit. Pardon? <laughs> yeah, it, it usually isn't a big part of it. So. If geriatrics is a small piece, can you imagine how tiny the piece is that says anything about culture change and what that can mean? It's an issue. Therefore, the term culture change for most of the people that even could be potential employees for your organization, they don't know what it means. They don't know what that word means. So that's why I dug in a little bit more into the words that we want to use. That's who's on board. And there's also one other issue that impacts nurses overall. And that is, you have over half of the nurses in the country that are over 50. Now, unless all of us are planning on working till we're 90. Mel talked about that she has a problem with the term of silver tsunami. In this case, you have a retirement tsunami. And yes, there are going to be some negative impacts with that retirement tsunami because who's going to replace all that wonderful experience and understanding and knowledge that you have as an experienced nurse? It is going to be an issue. There is, for most organizations, a fairly high level of turnover. And for the new nurses who are looking at long-term care, there's an issue in terms of the respect for the field as a whole. It does have an impact on who's out there and who's available. So it's time to be the super people that we really are and take a look at some of the distinguishing pieces that we want to talk about. 
very often when we talk about long-term care or nursing or whatever, it's all about the services that we provide. It, we focus on that we do this and we have these kinds of activities and we, we have these kinds of services. If I say the words Apple or Starbucks or Tom's Shoes, are there images that pop into your head, whether you like them or not, are there images that pop into your head of their culture? Or do you just think of the Starbucks cup of coffee? Is there something about the culture that pops into your head? They're selling more than just a cup of coffee. They're selling the whole culture. When I walk in and plunk down my $5 for that, <laughs> well, in the, in the one case, my girlfriend prefers caribou, so we wind up going there. But it is $5 for my Northern Light Mocha, I not only get something that's made expressly how I want, because I want the dark chocolate, I not only have the opportunity to get it hot instead of as a cooler, I not only have the opportunity to, to get it in this fashion with this size, but it's fair trade beans. I'm helping some poor farmer halfway across the planet make a living. Gee, I feel good about that. <laughs> We contribute to their college scholarship. I'm helping that wonderful person behind the counter get an additional education. So not, not only have I gotten my wonderful beverage exactly like I want it, I've helped a farmer across the world, and I've helped this wonderful staff person further their education, all for a measly five bucks. What a wonderful culture we've created. It's not the service, it's the culture. It's not the product, it's the culture. What you have with Eden Alternative or the other culture change organizations is not the list of services, it's the culture. Because when you start talking to nurses, <coughs> you start finding out they have chosen the career because it satisfies internally. And they're looking for an organization that matches. They're looking for an organization that resonates with them personally. It's that alignment with the personal goals. And you know what? Then they come along and they say, we'd like to get the approval of others as well. How many of you have looked around your communities and you look at other facilities and you go, oh, poor things. They have to work with them. They have to work in that environment. It's a shame they can't work over here. Do you ever catch yourself kind of going, we're just a little better? Now, the reality is you probably are. But there is a sense of, oh, you have to work there. I'm sorry. <laughs> You don't get to work with us over here in the really good facility. It's a match. Social identity theory says that we want to associate with other folks who are like us, hence the reason that we're all gathered here, because we want to learn more about what in the world is going on with culture change. We have personal goals that we want to align and we want others to approve. It's the culture. It's like a few years ago, one of the, the political slogans was, it's the economy stupid. Yeah, I would never call anybody stupid, but it's the culture that we're talking about. And we need to really make use of that. So I want to just talk very uh, quickly through the analysis of the framework. And there's a person by the name of Ron Taylor who came up with this, and I'm only going to say this once because it's a tongue twister, but a six-segment strategy <laughs> wheel. Ron Taylor's research from 1999. And he started as a way to help people better understand what drives decisions. Why do you make the choices that you do? Why? Why, what needs underlie those choices so that you make those choices? What are the underlying needs? Now, how many of you think that you are rational, 
thoughtful people, and then you always make rational decisions. Yeah? Yeah. If you're nurses, I would suspect that you're going to go more on the rational side and, and say, yep, I do. I make good, thoughtful, rational decisions. And we, frankly, all think that we are all about that. The informational half of the wheel that's highlighted here initially is about that information seeking, about the knowledge that we want to gain about something. It is the rational part of the brain. But there's the other half of it, and we'll talk about the transformational side, that has an amazing impact on nurses' perceptions and understanding of culture change and where they are. So let's go through the, the informational side. The rational side is, is exactly what you think probably does happen. It is, you're, they're checking out, when somebody new comes on board, you want to know what your pay is, what your benefits are, right? Everybody looks for those kinds of things. <coughs> Excuse me. You want to better understand what the hours are. You're going to go for all of those informational pieces so that it really does become, uh, you're well informed before you accept the spot. That's what rational does for you. Then there's a level of acute need, and the nurses that I interviewed had less to say about this one because they were already in a job. They didn't need the job, but the acute need typically drives fast decisions where you just get it taken care of. If you have a flat tire, what's your need? You, get a, you gotta get a new tire, absolutely right. The routine one was an interesting one as we started talking with the nurses because many of them focused on routine and talked about it that in a traditional setting there was a very specific routine that they followed. But in the culture change organization it became a whole different focus and it became the elders routine. So they were there to meet the elders routine, not necessarily theirs. And it was a shift in focus and a shift in how they dealt with it. What was so interesting to me is that it really became a reinterpretation of the experience of healthcare. And let me, I had a, an epiphany moment. I read a book called Spider and Starfish and it talks about organizations and it really I'd really hunted hard for a, a happy spider. I'm not a spider fan. In my house, when I see one, there's a, as quick as I possibly can. But Spider and Starfish is, is a book by uh, Beckstrom and, and Brathman, and they talk about two different kinds of organizations. And what was just wild for me to, to better understand the organizations is that spider organizations are very centrally controlled it is a command and control kind of an organization. Now, neither of these types of organizations are bad. They're just different in how they function. Spiders have central command. The leg doesn't move without the central command going, OK, let's move that leg. In starfish organizations, what happens if you whack off a leg of a starfish? It grows a new starfish. Yeah. It continues to function just fine. There's autonomy in the legs of the starfish that are totally missing from the legs of the spider. When you have a spider organization, it looks like most traditional medical operations. What happens if somebody wants to get permission? You go up the chain of command, you get an answer, do, 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 and it comes back, right? Isn't that typically how medical organizations work? You go up, get permission, and come on back down the layers. What happens in a starfish organization? That little leg just kind of goes, oh, well, I'm fine here. I'm, I'm just going to flip up here and do this. Those frontline staff have the authority, the autonomy, to do what is best 
in the organization. Now, it's not a, an exact match in the analogy, but it was astonishing because when you take your typical culture change organization, do you know what you're talking about? You're talking a starfish organization. You are not asking for permission from a central source. You are giving the autonomy to the frontline staff. Is that good for an elder? Go do it. Is that appropriate <clears throat> for that elder to have? Have at it. You give that kind of control to the frontline staff. What happens when you, <clears throat> and this is where if you have a spider organization that's used to the command and control kind of philosophy, and you start to implement a starfish philosophy, do you ever think that there's going to be resistance to that? They're used to command and control. If you change that up, you're going to be seriously affecting some people's routines. They like the routine as a spider organization. They're not comfortable with the autonomy that you get in a starfish organization. Pick up the book, take a read, and you will see where some of the issues can be resolved because it was amazing to me. We had a colossal, well, maybe colossal is a little strong, but a spectacular fail in one organization that I work with. Because we, we went to this group of individuals and said, not in, in terms of being a starfish, but said, guess what? You get to figure it out, and you get to self-regulate. And we cross-trained activities and we cro with, with the housekeeping and, and the CNA functions. And we went, OK, now go be starfish and make life happy for, for the elders that live in that neighborhood. And they went, oh. Uh, um, and it was leadership issues that were at fault because they were very, very good spiders. They were lousy starfish, and we did not help them learn how to be starfish. We just said, here, go be starfish. Go make more. And they went, <laughs> and so they went back to what they knew, which was command and control being spiders. And within about four months, it blew up. It became more rigid control than what they had started with. It was an interesting experiment. Again, that's part of the Eden journey. If you're not willing to risk, hang on, hang on. Spider and starfish, see which you are and which your group is. Because the second half of Ron Taylor's strategy wheel deals with the things that are important, frankly, for all of us, but that resonate particularly with starfish. I'm going to start on the bottom. When you talk about sensory things, sensory needs that people have, you're talking about the things that, that provide those moments of enjoyment. Anybody in here like chocolate? Yeah. Smell it. Yeah. Got your favorite chocolate? It's a sensory thing. And isn't it interesting how he's looking at this from a needs analysis, and it matches what Eden offers with simple pleasures? Think about what simple pleasures are. Simple things that you can repeat frequently that brings somebody a little bit of joy, a little bit of happy. Isn't that cool? Sensory. What do you, t what do you typically expect to smell when you walk into a long-term care facility? Yeah. Things that are not wonderful, right? One of the facilities that I worked with had a popcorn machine up at the front so you walked in and you, you went, and, and I used to watch people every once in a while. It was great. They'd walk in, and particularly if it was the first time they were in, they'd walk in and they'd kind of go, 
You could see what they were prepared for, but suddenly the smell of fresh popcorn was like, oh. It changed things in a drastic way. Sensory needs are for all of us. But where the, the biggest factor was, was with ego. And when I talk about ego, I don't want to just talk about um, that up in our Midwestern culture, having a big ego is not a good thing. But ego, from Taylor's perspective, is the sense of self, who we are as people, a statement about ourself. And very often, we pick vocations that resonate with self. Social is those things that are visible to the other folks around you, in the community, all of those kinds of things. Do you have organizations in your community or in your region where you look at them and you go, no, I don't want to work there. Mm, no, I would not. My application will never go into that organization. Why? Why wouldn't you work there? Yeah. You don't like the culture. Why else? Because you couldn't put your own mother or father there. Yeah, if you want to share the mic. Other thoughts? Why wouldn't you want to work in those facilities? You got to get that one on, on tape. Here she comes. Because of what you smell when you walk in the front door. Yeah. Because of that sensory piece. Got another one here. Oh, because they don't well, value they just need it for the tape is all. Uh, thank you. Because they don't value their staff. Because they don't value their staff. Absolutely. All of those kinds of things that talk about the needs that people have. Ego, social, sensory. All of the things that are on the flip side of that informational, rational thing, but they impact us. They impact nurses in amazing ways. There's, there's details that I could provide in far greater detail than you want. But let's look at the two that were the strongest expressed needs, the ego and the social. Let's talk about those and tap into that a little bit. When we talk about the ego, it is the identity you, you come to a place of work that is congruent with who you see yourself as being. And so that work becomes an extension of yourself, fit with the self and the job. It meshes together. It's one of the things that we put great emphasis in Eden on seeing who as whole people. Who do we see as whole people within the Eden? The elders. You know what the nurses said in the research? Time and time and time again. Guess who else gets seen as a whole person in a culture change organization? The nurses. The nurses did. They finally felt like they were more than just a replaceable commodity on the operational budget. They felt like they were seen, they were perceived. And it goes right to that ego and the social piece that you have here. So let's talk a little bit about the ego and why it's a good thing as it's defined here. They were provided a voice. They were able to be heard. Again, if you are in an innovative organization, you have the opportunity to actually say something and have somebody listen to you. You may not always be the frontline person, but you are the person that is able to see an entire unit, an entire neighborhood, an entire group and go, huh, I wonder if we did this, could we fix that? You get a voice. 
you get a voice with culture change. Some of the terms were champion, leader, and advocate. Now those are very powerful, powerful ego words. If I tell you that I'm a champion, do you think I have an ego? Well, maybe. If I tell you that I'm an advocate, there's ego words all the way through here. One of the fun things was, was talking about the um, getting to hear what, what some of the folks were, were saying, and, and I want to quote them exactly here, so let me just do that. Chris said that the biggest satisfaction is feeling like I make a difference. When describing themselves as, as champions, the research talks about turning the commonplace into passion. Turning the commonplace into passion. I thought that was so powerful. It isn't that you're not, you're, you're going to go back to your, your place of employment and suddenly put on the Supergirl cape or Superman cape and, and leap tall buildings at a single bound. You're still going to be doing those day-to-day -day things. There's still charting to be done. There's still discipline to be done. There's still care for the elders. There's all of those things that you do. But when you're a champion and an advocate and a leader, it changes something inside. It changes something inside. Emily said, the elders need passionate, competent health care providers. They need an advocate. Other departments like emergency, ICU, or med surge, they're sexy. Yeah. You've got a lot of people who are researching and advocating for those departments, but gerontology really doesn't have that. I think they need it. So that's why I've stayed in it. It needs, they need me. Is that ego? Yeah, that's ego. But it's a very positive kind of ego. Culture change such as Eden attracts different people, most of them said. And uh, Nan made the point that she said, our main focus is going to be the elders that we serve. And if we're doing that, that attracts certain type of people. You attract people with big hearts. They're defining who they were. They're defining nurses in different ways. It's all ego pieces. Making a difference and underlying it all was a sense of passion. The ego needs that these people have drive their decisions drive what they're going to do, how they're going to do it, what they're going to pick. So yeah, ego is definitely a good thing for, for folks to experience. Second biggest find was that social is also good. And by social, it means that we're looking for approval from the folks around us, the people who are in our communities. Here, the relationship piece just plays out. You've heard it all the way through that the relationship with the elders, you saw it uh, this morning in, in some of the sessions they talked about being dismissed, that somehow the elder is invisible. The older adult becomes Nobody that you talk to, you talk over, around, not to that older adult. In this kind of arrangement, the geriatric nurses said that the relationship with the elder and with other partners was huge. They valued those relationships because they were so important from what they learned from them. Within the, the culture change organization, they really felt that they had time for elders. There was all kinds of comments made that if you took time to sit down with an elder in a more traditional facility, often they had been scolded for that in previous work experiences. Those kinds of, of opportunities were far less. Where in culture change, they were encouraged 
And so one lady said, I never thought. She said, my husband gave me a pool cue for Christmas. I keep it behind my door at work because there's one gentleman every day he comes in and he goes, hey, kid, ready for another game? I'm going to beat you today again, you know. I said, who knew that I'd be playing pool every day at work? I said, I kind of like this. I kind of like this. There's time. There's time for the elders. In the midst of providing quality care, there's also the emphasis on time. And believe me, the nurses said they appreciated. And the perspective is also different. Connie said, you develop these meaningful relationships. If you're stocking in a gas station, what meaning does that bring to your life or to the item's life? I get to make a difference every day. Every day. Turner and Teifel, who did a lot of work in social identity, talks about the positively valued differentiation. It connects us to our social identity, and the language is a huge piece of that. How we convey information is huge. Social needs were highly regarded by the nurses. They understood that it was essential. There's also one other quote that I wanted to give you. When you talk about the relationships, and it speaks to the importance, uh, Scott Matthews and Kerwin in 14, 2014 talked about that those relationships between the care partners and the residents were, were critical. And what they found is that the residents seek cues from staff regarding the level of interest the staff member has in the patient as a person. They want to know that they're people. Before the elder is going to engage with the staff member, they want to know, do you see me? Do you see who I am? And the perception of the nurses is that they had time, in fact, to do that. One, one other individual, Wade, noted that we're all really proud of what we're doing here, and there's a lot to be proud of of social identity says we want to be proud of our organizations and that is absolutely true. There's an impact on the larger community. Speaking as a child of a parent in a long-term care facility, is a, there's an impact not only on the elder living in that particular community, it's an impact on all of the family members as well. The impact that the nurses have on the larger community is immense. And they felt very committed and proud of that impact, that they knew that they were making a difference, not only within the walls, but outside as well. And taking great pride in doing better. So yeah, the good news is that social is huge and very good news. In asking the nurses which they would choose, the culture change or traditional, without exception, they picked culture change as the choice of where they would want to go. And we looked at it a little bit, but the innovation was valued. The fact that the elders had a voice, but that they did too was huge and it required a different language all the way through. Because of that, the term of culture change, if you're looking to talk to other nurses, other communities, other folks out in the community, the term culture change, because it isn't as widely used as we'd like, may not have the impact or the news. One of our the nurses that I interviewed said that when she was making the job switch from a traditional to a culture change facility, she was assured by the previous DON that she wouldn't like it in the culture change facility. And the, her exact words, it's a cult, you know. <laughs> oh. She went anyway, and it was a good thing. But culture change may not tell 
the whole story that you want it to be. So we need to find other words. So what are some of the words? We've, we've looked at them. Champion, advocate, making a difference, freedom, growth, meaning to life, all of those things. What are your ego words? On your handout, there's an opportunity there. And I've talked probably more than I need to. But take a minute at your tables. Talk about what are some of the ego words that describe you in your role where you're at. How would you describe you? Um, are, pardon? They empower us when we're working with management. We empower to make decisions for what's best, like you said, for you, for the elder. You need to um, <coughs> take care of partners, make their own schedules. Oh. What, what she just said is, in her facility, she is empowered. In fact, I'm going to come back and snitch the microphone from you again. It was too good not to have it repeated. <laughs> I'll start you off. You said that they're empowered in your community. We're at empowered where I work at. Um, you're empowered to make the decision for yourself whether that's good for the elder is it good for you is it good you know as a village they really hear your voice even our care partners have empowered scheduling they make the they sit down as a team they make their own work schedule and you know everyone plays a part in taking care of the elders it's not like I mean we have leadership but it's not like everything goes to the bus kind of like that starfish Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's very true. When you have a starfish kind of organization, and I don't need this, sorry. But when you have a starfish organization, you have the autonomy to do some things. So what are some of those words that resonate with you? You have empowered. Are there other words that resonate? As you think about yourself? I'm a listener. I listen. We have a listener. What else? Uh, Eden Guru. Eden Guru. Oh, I like that one. What else? At my facility, I'm an advocate for the uh, elders. An advocate. Absolutely. What else? Who are you? Fun. Fun. Uh -huh. You're a partner. A partner. Pass that over if you will. Leading change. Leading change. Anybody at the back table? Be brave. <laughs> back over there. A facilitator. <laughs> we'll get the good word back on. A facilitator. A facilitator. Somebody who is helping making sure things happen. A friend. Oh. He just made my heart kind of go, oh, I love it. Yes. All of the, the championing, but of being a friend. Educator. And an educator. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Opportunities not only for the other staff, but for the elders to grow. In the session that was in here just before, how cool is it when you can encourage people to continue to grow in their lives, regardless of how old or young they are? We all want to know how to do it better. So use your words of self, of ego, because they're strong words and they're good ones. And use your words that imply social. Take a minute, think about who you are in your community. And I split it out for communication and unity purposes. Who are you? Who do you think of yourself? When I was interviewing the nurses, they talked about relationship that was huge, that they had opportunities for those personal connections. But they got a chance to share the wisdom of the elders 
that was also part of it. There was enough relationship and social things going on they could connect. They were part of a family. There was love, comfort, passion, purpose. Who doesn't want to be in an organization like that and affiliated with that kind of an organization? Those were some of their key words. Now I challenge you, who are you in your larger community? What are some words that would define who you are in that larger social setting? Think about that. And I'd be up for some ideas with that as well. You mean like where we live, not in our... In, our in, our, in your work. In your, in your work. Right, in your, in your work community. Okay. What are some words that would describe you in your work community? Teacher. A teacher, absolutely. Again, building relationships, having that social connection. Who are you in those? Cheerleader. Say it again. Cheerleader. A cheerleader, yeah. Working in your groups, helping other people be successful. liaison a connector a liaison connecting one point to another absolutely a catalyst for change a catalyst a catalyst for change it makes a world of difference so you have the words to be using ego words social words could I suggest that you use those words? Use them as you start talking with people. You all, most of you raised your hand that there's openings in your organization. Could I suggest that you go back and talk? Maybe this is time for another learning circle. Get the nurses to tell their story about why they want to work there, why it's important for them to be there. Anytime I go into an organization and they want me to tell their story, you know who I go and talk to? Some of the, the staff there, because I want to know if what they're telling me over here is true in actual reality. When you start bringing a nurse on board, pair that person up with, with an existing nurse because they're going to ask all the good questions and ask the reality. Does it match what the words on paper say? Is it really like that? Use those wonderful words and make it consistent so that you use those ego and social words frequently. Make it happen. And then again, let me repeat it. Not only using your words and your team's words, but use them. Make it consistent all the way through. And let me tell you the power of that very quickly. And it goes like this was working with an organization and the administrator always said it's a great day at Pioneer the name of the organization and it didn't matter if the sewer had backed up if somebody had fallen down and if somebody else had complained for the 13th time that their dinner was cold if you turned them around and said how's the day it's a great day it's a great day at Pioneer and you kind of go really but he was consistent with it, and you knew that he was honest about it because he was always looking for something good in the day. Always, that was his perspective. You heard, I think Mel, was it yesterday, talking about gratitude? Yeah, being grateful. Even on days when things are just, you're like that initial person, you're ready to pull your hair out, <clears throat> there's still an opportunity for something good. So in his perspective, it was always a great day at Pioneer. One day, I was taking a family on, on a tour through there, and we were chatting about this and that, and they were friends, uh, which is the reason that I was doing that at that point in time. And they, they stopped, and they did exactly what I would do. They caught one of the frontline people and said, so, how's your day? And without so much as missing a beat, 
this wonderful frontline person said, it's a great day at Pioneer. And I went, it came through. It was consistent. It was repeated. And if you can use those ego and social words to tie the message together, it's that much stronger all the way through. Let me give you an example. If you're looking for a nursing spot, could I suggest that you do something besides we offer good, good pay and benefits? Let me give you an example of how you might use the ego and social words. Let's say you've, you're, you're uh, advertising on one of the job shops and it says, we have an open nursing position, but it's not a typical geriatrics job. Yep, we have the usual pay and good benefits. But working here is more about having the freedom to be an advocate for older adults, being innovative, providing the kind of care that matters to elders, having fun with elders and other care partners who soon become like family. Come experience the difference at besthomeever.com. Now, would you be interested in going and working for a place like that? Would you want to take a look at them? They've told you that you have something beyond just a paycheck. They said that you are valued beyond the usual rational insights. So use your words. Don't be afraid. And if you want to share more words, I'd be loving to hear them. Thank you for the time. I appreciate being here. All the best.